Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for being here today. We're going to get started shortly. I'll give folks a moment to settle in. Thanks everyone for joining. I'm just giving folks a moment to get settled in and we will get started shortly. Okay, it's uh, 101, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for being here and joining us for today's webinar. This webinar is hosted by the Safe Routes Partnership. Today we're going to be talking about connecting people to parks in Oregon communities. First, a little bit about our organization. The mission of the Safe Routes Partnership is to advance safe walking and rolling to and from schools and in everyday life, improving the health and well being of people of all races, income levels, and abilities, and building healthy, thriving communities for everyone. Our vision We know that our bodies were designed to move, yet many of our communities were created with intentional inequities that limit mobility. We believe that change is necessary to achieve a vision of safe, active, equitable, and healthy communities, urban, suburban, and rural for everyone. Our organization works to advance policies and increase funding for active transportation and healthy, equitable communities at the federal, state, and local levels. Our team works remotely across the country and two of our staff are located here in Oregon. The Safe Routes Partnership also provides one-on-one -on -one consulting and coaching to those working to advance walking, biking, and equitable active communities. A little later in today's webinar, I'll share some opportunities to take advantage of free one-on-one -on -one technical assistance in Oregon. The Safe Routes Partnership supports Safe Routes to School program development and implementation through our partnerships with local leaders, residents, and coalition partners and we share our deep expertise and learn from the field to provide solutions through webinars, toolkits, and relevant resources. So now that I've shared a little bit about our organization, I'd like to go ahead and introduce those on our webinar today. I'll go ahead and introduce the panel, which um, these are the folks that are gonna be presenting on our webinar today. First, I'll introduce myself. I'm Becky Gilliam. I'm a program support manager for the Safe Routes Partnership. I live in Silverton, Oregon. I've worked for the partnership for over three years, and until recently, I've been working on advancing Safe Routes to School and active transportation policy and programming here in Oregon. Now I have the opportunity to provide technical assistance to folks all across the country on behalf of the Safe Routes Partnership. I'd also like to acknowledge my colleagues who are on uh, on the call today helping support our webinar. Natasha Riveron and Corey Johnson are here as well. Corey is a program support manager and Natasha is our Healthy Parks and Places Manager. I believe she'll be available to help answer questions about Safe Routes to Parks later on in our call. So next I'll introduce the rest of our panelists. Allison Harris is the statewide Walk with Ease Program Coordinator through the Oregon State University Extension Service. She works in partnership with the Oregon Health Authority and the community organization to oversee instructor-led, self-directed, and online virtual Walk With Ease programs here in Oregon. Allison also coordinates the SNAP education program in Coos and Curry County. She has a master's degree in public health and a special interest in nutrition concerns of low-income populations and physical activity. Amanda Parsons is the Marketing and Communications Manager for the Oregon Recreation and Parks Association. She is responsible for outreach and communications with membership and works to provide supportive environment for professionals in the field of parks and recreation. Amanda has had a varied career in marketing, event planning, project management, and educational development. 
With a degree in public health, Amanda looks at the world through the lens of improving communities and creating programs with equitable access. Nicole Paulson is a park planner with the Tualatin Hills Park and Recreation District. Nicole is a certified park and recreation professional who, for the past 15 years, has been immersed in the planning, design, and development of community infrastructure, including parks, utilities, and housing with an emphasis on parks and trails. Huge thank you to all of our panelists for being here today. So just a quick agenda of what we'll be covering today. We've gone through our introductions of our panel, and next I'll be introducing and presenting an overview of the Safe Routes to Parks framework and our new toolkit, Connecting People to Parks, a toolkit to increase safe and equitable access to local parks and green spaces. After that, we'll hear from Allison Harrison, who Harris will be speaking about the intersection of Walk with Ease and Safe Routes to Parks. Then Nicole Paulson is going to share some experiences and tips for implementing Safe Routes to Parks here in Oregon. After these presentations, Amanda Parsons and I will share a couple of upcoming opportunities for continued learning and technical assistance related to the toolkit and Safe Routes to Parks. Finally, we'll close out with a discussion and Q&A. If you do have questions that come up during the presentation, please feel free to drop those into the chat and we'll do our best to answer them during Q&A. So let's dive in. Um, first, what is Safe Routes to Parks? Safe Routes to Parks is a movement to make great parks safer and easier for people to access by walking, bicycling, and taking public transportation especially in low-income communities and communities of color, where less investment has gone into the route to and the amenities in parks. We do this work because safe places to walk, bike, and connect with nature directly contribute to physical, mental, and social well-being. Especially after this year, we've seen or heard from so many people, our neighbors, our families, the folks that we work with, um, who've really seen um, or expressed a renewed appreciation for these outdoor spaces close to home. The Safe Routes to Parks initiative was originally developed through a grant from the CDC to the National Recreation and Parks Association to support the Surgeon General's call to action on walking and walkability. The National Recreation and Parks Association invited the Safe Routes Partnership to work with the Trust for Public Land and the American Planning Association to develop the Safe Routes to Parks Action Framework, which serves as a guide for advocates to work through the process of assessing park access, planning improvements, implementing changes, and sustaining the work. So you'll notice this graphic on the right, which shows this continual process of integrating those four elements into the Safe Routes to Parks Framework. You'll also notice that the fifth element, engagement, is at the center of that process. Community members are essential to the process of project selection, design, and implementation because they are the local experts on their neighborhoods. Partnering with community leadership acknowledges the wisdom and assets that communities hold and can be the first step toward rectifying past and ongoing injustices built into our communities by racist land use and capital investment policies and practices. These decisions and policies have led to poor health outcomes, less access to safe, high quality public spaces, decreased physical activity, and higher rates of traffic related injuries and fatalities among low income communities and communities of color. Collectively, we have the opportunity and responsibility to create conditions that enable all people to build on their community's strengths to ensure high quality community assets are accessible and safe for people of all ages, abilities, and disabilities. Safe routes to parks can provide a whole host of benefits, which can include the following increasing equitable access for people regardless of their race, ethnicity, age, or ability, increasing opportunities for physical activity, improving safety from traffic and personal violence, 
Safe routes to parks can help decrease the environmental impact of daily travel and strengthen community connections. So we have a new Oregon specific toolkit with resources developed to help parks and recreation agencies, as well as other Safe Routes to Parks advocates to support local level change guided by their partnership with community members. This toolkit was developed, developed specifically for communities in Oregon. However, people from all over the country and backgrounds can benefit from the toolkits and guidance within. The majority of the tools will be useful and understandable regardless of whether you have a background in parks and recreation. In fact, I am curious who all we have joining us on today's webinar. I'd like to go ahead and do a quick poll. And this poll is going to ask you what your role is in the work at the intersection of transportation, health, climate change, and equity. Please take the quick poll that just popped up on your screen. Let us know if you're a parks and recreation professional, a local advocate, safe route to school practitioner, public health professional. Um, there's a couple of options on there and other option as well. Please select the option that best describes your role and I'm interested to see who we have in the room. I'll give you just a moment to go ahead and um, respond. Awesome, lots of responses coming in. Really appreciate everyone's interaction. Um, I think that we can go ahead and uh, close the poll. So it looks like we do have um, a majority of parks and recreation professionals on our call today, um, government agency staff, safe routes to school practitioners, public health professionals, advocates, and it looks like an elected official and several others who um, maybe don't quite fit into one of those categories. So really excited to see everyone on today's webinar. And I want you to know, and I wanna emphasize that um, regardless of your position or your role, we all have a role to play in Safe Routes to Parks. And I really do think that this toolkit and this webinar more generally will be applicable to the work that you do. Thanks for participating in that. So I want to do two things today. I want to introduce the toolkit and give you an overview of how to use it. We know that sometimes opening a big toolkit can be somewhat daunting. So I wanna provide a sort of roadmap to help you figure out how to approach this toolkit. Then I will highlight a couple of resources and cool features within the toolkit. So this toolkit walks you through the process that we use to advance Safe Routes to Parks, and it's divided into five sections to correspond with those five elements of the Safe Routes to Parks framework. Throughout the toolkit, we've also included stories of successful Safe Routes to Parks funding and implementation in communities in Oregon and across the country. You'll find tools for collecting data, engaging community in planning and programming, and messaging to help you make the case for walkability, park access, and age-friendly community design. The toolkit includes templates and tables to take and use, including a meeting agenda, tables for engagement, sample press releases, social media content, and lots more. It also offers up 20, over 20 ideas for funding sources and ideas for creatively using existing funding for this work. Um, just a note about how this toolkit was developed. We developed this toolkit with support from the Oregon Health Authority and with funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. This toolkit was truly informed by the lived and professional experiences of stakeholders and partners that we work with in Oregon. The Safe Routes Partnership met with 21 individuals from 15 organizations to help inform the toolkit. We asked these partners what sorts of tools and resources would be most helpful to their work in supporting healthy community design, intergenerational cooperation, and livability for people, people of all ages and abilities. Stakeholders included a diverse group of nonprofit and public organizations working to support health, walkability, and recreation in Oregon communities. 
Our team then reviewed these results, did a bunch of research on funding streams, resources, and collected case studies in Oregon to develop the toolkit. To make sure this was in line with what folks had asked for, then we then followed up with a smaller group of our original stakeholders for an additional review. Um, and I do just want to say we're so grateful to all of our partners who contributed to the de development of this toolkit. So again, the toolkit is divided into five sections to correspond with the five elements of the Safe Routes to Parks framework. Engage, assess, plan, implement, and sustain. I want to show you an example of how these elements show up as their own section in the toolkit. Let's take a look at engage first. Each of these sections includes a list of steps to take with specific resources to guide application. The steps to take aren't necessarily the order that you have to follow, but it's helpful to orient, orient you to what is included within each section. So in Engage, you'll find a resource called Defining Roles and Partnerships for Safe Routes to Parks. This is a roadmap to join or build a coalition of partners to work with on Safe Routes to Parks. As we just saw in our poll, uh, Safe Routes to Parks draws in all kinds of different partners. Um, this resource really helps you to define, begin to define those roles and establish partnerships. You'll see there are three other steps listed here. Again, you don't need to follow in that order, but you'll see that we link to three other re resources within this section, including one that helps you connect your priorities with other partners to communicate how Safe Routes to Parks can help achieve shared goals and a resource that offers a deeper dive on working with unhoused communities in your Safe Routes to Parks efforts. In addition to those steps to take with links to individual resources, each of the sections in the toolkit also includes reflection questions, a walk with ease connection box, and a toolbox with specific tools to put these ideas and strategies learned into action. This is a sample of our guiding questions. Again, looking at the engage section. These are questions to ask in, the phase, in this phase of the Safe Routes to Parks framework. Examples include, what are the current efforts in your community that align with Safe Routes to Parks? And how can I support community residents to lead this effort? To demonstrate how Safe Routes to Parks efforts can integrate with existing projects and programming, there's an additional box here to um, help make that connection with Walk With Ease. You'll hear lots more about Walk With Ease shortly in the next presentation from Allison Harris. Finally, at the beginning of each section and sprinkled throughout, you'll find these toolboxes to put the ideas into action. Tools include templates for agenda planning, community surveys, social media messaging, poster design, press releases, and so much more. Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit through how to approach and use the toolkit, I want to go through and highlight some specific resources. One resource I do want to call out is one that I mentioned earlier. This is called Strategies for Working with Unhoused Communities in Parks. If homelessness is a particular challenge in your community and in your parks, you can use this resource to think about homelessness from multiple perspectives consider different approaches to talking about and working with unhoused communities, and gather ideas for educating the broader community about the complexities of homelessness. Next, I wanna talk about data. We know that data can seem boring, hard to work with, and even intimidating. But if you know what to do with it, data can be the power booster that Safe Routes to Parks efforts need to make changes for safer, more equitable park access. This resource in the toolkit called Finding and Using Data to Support Safe Routes to Parks provides ideas for ways to access and collect data, as well as ways to effectively share that information to improve safe, equitable access to parks and green spaces. It includes curated lists of linked resources for national, state, and local data quantitative and qualitative data collection tools, and platforms to present the data that you've collected. Next, this resource called Moving from Shelf to Shovel, Creating Action Plans that Actually Get Implemented, 
provides guidance for organizing and hosting community action planning that will help your coalition synthesize the ideas you have collected into clear next steps for making your vision come to life and identify who's responsible for each step of each piece of implementation. There's no right or wrong way to develop an action plan, but a tried and true strategy is to host a meeting where people gather to prioritize ideas. This fact sheet walks you through organizing a productive action planning meeting, including a sample two-hour meeting agenda with activities. Face off to parks lies at the intersection of active transportation and parks and recreation. Allocating funding to the connections that get people to their local park or green space allows residents to benefit from the multitude of health and safety benefits that come with safe and equitable access to nature. This fact sheet, Paying for Safe Routes to Parks Implementation, focuses on local, state, and federal public funds that can go towards Safe Routes to Parks work. The strategies to move existing funding towards improving safe and equitable park access and the partnerships that can help facilitate both. This resource shares over 20 ideas for creatively using existing funding for this work. So in addition to having Oregon specific content in each section of the toolkit, including the resources, information about data and funding streams, the toolkit also features case studies of local implementation. We feature stories of Safe Routes to Parks implementation in Oregon communities like Beaverton, Salem, Eugene, Klamath Falls, Portland, and Redmond. We also have lots of examples of implementation in other parts of the country as well. So now we really want to invite you to explore the toolkit. You can access the resource by visiting our website, the link I will be providing in the chat in a moment. Um, and we really look forward to hearing from you, what your questions are, and what you think of the toolkit, and look forward to watching lots more implementation of Safe Routes to Parks in Oregon communities. Okay, just a quick agenda check-in. We've gone through our introductions and an overview of Safe Routes to Parks and our new toolkit. Next up, we're going to be hearing from Allison Harris, and then we'll hear from Nicole Paulson. And then I'll come back to help close us out with Amanda Parsons when we'll talk about some technical assistance opportunities and then we'll open up for Q&A. So with that, I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen and invite Allison to start sharing hers. Okay, thank you, Becky. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking today about Walk With Ease and Safe Routes to Parks. Um, and here on the screen, you can see a group of um, individuals from a class last winter before everything shut down. Uh, Walk With Ease is a physical activity program for those that aren't familiar with it. So I'd like to start by talking about physical activity in the United States and Oregon. And then I'm going to dive into more details about the program and make some connections to safe routes to parks. So this slide here represents the proportion of adults that are currently meeting the physical activity guidelines for aerobic physical activity in the United States on the left and Oregon on the right. So the current guidelines are 150 minutes or more per week of moderate intensity aerobic activity. So currently you can see 53.3% of adults in the United States are currently meeting these guidelines and approximately 57% of Oregonians are getting the recommended levels of physical activity. Currently, only 31% of adults with disabilities report meeting the recommendations, and the lowest physical activity levels are among those with mobility issues and cognitive issues. So 57% of those with mobility issues report engaging in no aerobic activity, and 40% of those with cognitive issues report engaging in no aerobic physical activity. So interestingly, adults with disabilities are 82% more likely to participate in physical activity if their doctor recommends it, which is really encouraging. And this slide here looks at the per percentage of adults that are meeting the recommendations for both aerobic activity and muscle strengthening activity. So this is 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity aerobic activity and doing two days a week of muscle strengthening activities. So currently you can see 23.2% of the general US population are meeting these guidelines and only 22.3% of Oregonians report meeting both guidelines. So there's definitely still work to do in this area. 
<clears throat> so I want to highlight before we move on just a few of the many benefits of physical activity. So um, there are tons of benefits of physical activity, both physically and mentally. And these are just a few of them, but I wanna highlight these because many of these can actually be experienced within a very short time of beginning a physical activity regimen. So these are physical benefits like improved cardiovascular health, lower blood pressure and cholesterol. Um, there's psychological benefits like managing stress, improving your mood and even increasing creativity. And then another um, benefit that we talk a lot about in Walk With These is pain management. For people with disabilities, physical activity can also help support daily living activities and independence. And then I also want to talk a little bit about arthritis in Oregon. Um, arthritis is a really common condition that can inhibit physical activity. So it's both very prevalent and very expensive. An estimated one in four adults in, or in Oregon have arthritis. And in Oregon, arthritis costs $307 million in hospitalizations alone. So leading into Walk With Ease, um, Walk With Ease is an evidence-based physical activity program that was originally designed for people with arthritis and other chronic pain conditions. However, the program is available to everyone and can be beneficial for everyone. So anyone who's hoping to become more physically active can benefit from this program. We do have a lot of information in the program about arthritis as well as symptom management, but this is really just a piece. So there's a lot of information that will be helpful, even if you don't have an experience or diagnosis of arthritis. The program is proven to increase physical activity, decrease pain and fatigue, and increase physical ability and walking endurance. Um, and really, it just helps to make lifestyle changes. So anybody looking to be more active, this is a great program to get into. So I'd like to start by discussing the three different versions of the program. In Oregon, we offer instructor-led in-person classes, a self-directed program, and online virtual classes. And I'm gonna jump in in a little bit more depth in the following slides, but before I do that, I do wanna mention OSU Extension serves as the hub for Walk With Ease in Oregon. So we partner with the Oregon Health Authority and have CDC arthritis grant funding to support implementation of the program. We deliver in-person classes throughout the state through local extension offices and faculty and staff. Uh, we also support community organizations that lead the program. So these are sites like churches, community centers, senior centers, healthcare clinics, hospitals, and more. So instructor-led in-person classes, this is the original format of the program, and this is 18 sessions held either over six or nine weeks. The format of the sessions are health education combined with group walking. So we start with what we call a lecturette, um, and then end with group walking. And these are taught by a trained leader, usually OSU extension staff or a community organization staff. Um, and as part of the program, all participants receive a Walk With Ease book, which guides them through the program. In Oregon, we also offer a self-directed program. Um, and this program is completely online. So you can see on the left-hand side here, this is a screenshot of our registration form. Participants register online, and as soon as they register, they automatically receive a welcome email, followed up by six weekly emails and a request to fill out an evaluation. So these emails guide you through the book and the program and provide additional links and resources, as well as homework and weekly challenges. There is rolling registration for the program, so you can sign up at any time. It's completely online at your own pace. It's structured as a six-week course, but you can do it slower if you need to. Uh, and then as part of this program, everybody receives a workbook by mail. And a great perk of this program is that this is available free to all Oregonians. So including that workbook, it's a completely free program. And last, we have our virtual classes. And we've actually operated virtual classes through OSU Extension since 2017. These were originally supported by a mini grant from the Osteoarthritis Action Alliance. Um, and in 2020, we picked up and started expanding these programs. So prior to this, we had about one or two statewide classes per year on a virtual setting. Over the past year, this has expanded considerably due to COVID-19. These virtual classes are live webinar-based classes with a trained instructor. And it's typically a six-week program with sessions held once weekly through Zoom. So as part of this, um, the Zoom session includes more of the health education part and discussion and social connection. 
So we talk about symptom management, overcoming barriers, stretching and exercising safely, and really all of the things that we would be doing in the in-person classes gets talked about in the virtual setting. The major difference between the virtual class and the in-person class is that most of the time we're not doing activity together virtually. So participants are walking independently throughout the week. As part of this program, everybody receives a workbook by mail. So this is also typically a free program. And this has been a really great benefit over the past year specifically, because it's allowed people an opportunity to still get active, especially in their homes um, in the beginning of the pandemic, but it also offers social connection um, and structure and accountability. So this is kind of a hybrid between our self-directed class and our in-person classes. And I'm happy to answer any questions about the program. This is a high level overview. I'd like to transition into talking a little bit about Walk With Ease and Safe Routes to Parks, uh, but I'll have the website for our Walk With Ease program on, our, on the last slide on my contact slide. And these slides I believe will also go out to you. So if you have questions, you're welcome to take a look at the website or contact me or, or throw a question in the chat. So jumping into Safe Routes to Parks and Park Access, I wanna start by talking a little bit about the importance of park access to community health. So park access improves community health through a variety of ways. Uh, we talked earlier in the presentation about the many, many benefits of increased physical activity, and this is definitely um, a positive of park access. So that increased physical activity can lead to all sorts of benefits, but there's also psychological, social, and economic and environmental benefits of having a park in the community. So there's psychological benefits such as stress reduction, Studies of multiple populations have shown a variety of psychological, mental, and emotional benefits of having a view of nature through a window. Other studies show that people place value on the existence of parks, even when they don't actually use them. But actual use of parks is related to improved psychological health in a couple of ways. So in a study of older adult park users, researchers found that half of the participants were in a better mood after visiting the park. And another study found that park users experience lower levels of anxiety and sadness after visiting a park. Social benefits include increased social capital and opportunities to be social and build community. So social capital is the relationships among people that facilitate productive activity. And parks can play a role in increasing social capital by providing a space where people can come together and develop social ties in a setting where healthy behaviors like physical activity is modeled. So a little bit more research on the social benefits. Studies in low-income urban areas have suggested that park-like natural elements promote increased opportunities for social interactions. Um, studies among public housing residents suggest that the greener a building's surroundings, the fewer crimes, intrafamily aggression, and violence is reported. Settings in which there are more trees and vegetation appear to inhibit crime, aggression, and violence, while promoting social interaction among individuals. And last, the economic benefits. Um, outdoor recreation facilities can also provide a number of direct and indirect economic benefits for their communities. One of these ways is through increased property values for properties nearby a park. Additionally, there are environmental benefits of having a park in a community such as reducing air pollution. So you can see park access is really important to community health. And looking at Walk With Ease and park access, parks and recreation agencies are a major service provider for older adults. And older adults are one of our primary target populations for Walk With Ease. So looking at this, parks and rec agencies can support health and well-being of everyone, including older adults, by making parks more accessible and making parks available for evidence-based programs like Walk With Ease. So in many places around the state already, Walk With Ease is held in parks and often offered through parks and rec programs as well, um, and also through partnerships with parks and rec. And so this allows more people access to the program. More walkable communities can encourage community members to become more physically active. So um, park access and walkable communities can also improve participation in Walk With These classes and others like it um, by removing barriers to classes like transportation. So if you have a class nearby and your friends and neighbors are participating, you may also be more likely to join. So now I wanna talk a little bit about Walk With Ease in the Safe Routes to Parks Toolkit. And Becky touched on this a little bit in the beginning um, in her introduction, but I'd like to dive a little bit deeper and show you some examples of how Walk With Ease is really integrated into the toolkit. 
So on the left hand side here, you can see the Safe Routes to Parks Action Framework. Here's all the steps that Becky talked about. Um, and a Walk With Ease connection box is actually included in each section of the framework. So this includes tangible action steps, questions to ask, and ways to engage Walk With Ease participants in walkability and park accessibility initiatives. So I'm going to show two different slides. These are two sections of the toolkit. This first one comes from the engage section. So this on the left hand side, you can see the guiding questions for the section and on the right side, the walk with ease connection. So this one here talks about using walk with ease groups to connect with neighborhood residents. So as you walk or roll together, discuss their perceptions of accessibility and safety. And they also give a connection to virtual classes. So if you're working with a virtual class, here's some suggestions you can use to get people engaged. Things like including opportunities for people to get involved with local initiatives, incorporating information into the classes to get people thinking and talking about park access, and also making space for people to share virtually about their life stories and experiences uh, with walking and rolling, as well as the stories and experiences they collect during the program. And this is really important. This is one of the, one of the pieces that I really appreciate about this toolkit is that it talks about the virtual class aspect. And this can really help foster social connection and engagement, which can be a challenge with virtual programming. That's one of the biggest challenges, especially if everybody has their camera off, nobody wants to volunteer information. So having some guide, guidelines on how to engage people in walkability initiatives in a virtual setting is really important and helpful. Now the next slide here, this is the assess setting. Um, and I'm not gonna go through every single piece of the Walk With Ease connection. Um, you're welcome to take a look at it in the toolkit, but I just want to point out here how the guiding questions on the left for the section and the walk with these connection really parallel each other. Um, so these are things I'll, I'll highlight a couple things like holding a walking audit during walk with these to help assess the need uh, for more walkable communities and asking people how they got the location for walk with these. How are they getting to walk with these? Um, what's their transportation barriers? Things like that. So. Uh, Walk With Ease is really embedded throughout the toolkit. Um, I, I find it helpful. I hope that you do as well. At this point, I have our website on the screen and my contact information as well. Please feel welcome, as I said, to reach out to me if you have questions and visit our website to learn more about Walk With Ease. Thank you, Becky. I'm going to stop sharing and hand it back to you. Thanks so much, Allison. Um, I'm going to drop that link into the chat as well as folks want to drop that into their browser to explore more afterwards. Um, and I will hand it over to Nicole. Great. Thanks, Becky. I am going to work to share my screen here. Hoping everybody can see that. Uh, my name is Nicole Paulson. I'm a park planner with Walton Hills Park and Recreation District. I'm excited um, to walk through some of the ways that THPRD has implemented um, safe routes to parks throughout the district in a variety of different ways. And um, what the, we are located in Beaverton, Oregon, which is just outside of uh, Portland, Oregon, a little bit west of Portland. And we span about 50 square miles with uh, approximately a bit over 250,000 residents in our in our district and um, our our mission for the park district is to provide high quality park and recreation facilities program services and natural areas that meet the needs of the diverse community it serves um, and with that we understand that we have a very large and diverse community, um, whether that's age, race, ethnicity, ability, and it is um, of the highest importance to plan for um, plan to ensure that we understand what those community needs are. And so as we look at the toolkit for the Safe Routes to Parks, we um, understand that that engagement piece is um, throughout all of the different sections of the park. And the first way for us to make sure that we are hearing what our um, community is most interested in and, and most passionate about was to undertake a visioning process. And so to better plan for a proactive park district um, that meets the needs, all needs equitably, um, we need, as the district recognizes it, we need to conduct an inclusive, intentional, 
and multicultural community visioning process. And so our communications and engagement or uh, communications department um, started in um, 2018 and really um, worked on hearing the narratives out of underrepresented and historically underserved populations. Teach Purity is committed to prioritizing diversity, equity, inclusion, and aspects in all, um, in all ways of this work. And we sought to examine our assumptions and better understand what the communities today need and how to best serve um, our current interests, our long-term interests, our new and future residents. And so um, with that engagement process, we, uh, or excuse me, with that visioning process, we heard from over 12,000 people. We were able to attend 117 different engagement opportunities. We had dedicated volunteers going out regularly to our parks to connect with park users, um, attended multicultural events, created focus groups, youth engagement opportunities. Um, and through that, we had a vision task force team that were able to take all of those ideas um, and synthesize that information to really help guide um, and create these kind of overarching themes for our district that you see right here, which is being welcome and inclusive, a play for everyone, accessible and safe, pres and preserving natural spaces. So with that, um, with this visioning, overarching visioning goals, we were able to really look at doing um, events tailored to what we were hearing from, from our community and ways that we were able to do that is to create, um, we started a welcoming walk program where we um, partnered with Unite Oregon to really celebrate our immigrant and, Im immigrant and refugee community members. Um, bringing them into um, parks so that um, folks can understand what parks are around their areas. Also, what services and offerings THPRD has to provide for our community, community members. Additionally, we have park ambassadors where um, we have volunteers that are out in the parks to hear patrons comments, concerns, questions. I like to think of it as non-automated. Um, you think of when you call a cable company or somebody, you have to press four and then option seven to get somewhere. This, you have an actual face-to-face -face person that um, is in the parks and able to offer um, guidance on either offerings or be able to direct questions and comments to appropriate staff. We also work with our partner agencies, um, our county agency, Washington County, and our city of Beaverton, um, the city that we are located in. Uh, to really work on um, making sure that we have uh, our guidelines and our standards incorporated um, into their active transportation plans, as well as partnering with agencies such as Beaverton School District and Safe Routes to Parks, or excuse me, Safe Routes to Schools to um, create engagement opportunities. We just held one last Saturday with Beaverton School District where we were able to kind of um, attend an event that they were already hosting um, in efforts to receive some information and feedback on a new park that we were that we're about to start designing. The next um, section of the Safe Routes to Parks Toolkit would really looks at assessment. And um, so as we have these overarching um, mission statement and visioning statement, we really uh, also want to look at the boots on the ground documents, which are our functional plans that really help assess where we're at in the district, what our opportunities are, what our strengths are, maybe some areas that we may, may um, be lacking in. And so we've done a parks inventory, as well as a trails inventory analysis to really better understand um, and, and visually see where, where we have opportunities to increase a level of service. With that being said, um, we've really shifted in the last 10 years to really focus on a more walkable, walkable community. We uh, typically had really looked at numbers per, per capita essentially or, or per person, looking at maybe um, having a park every quarter mile to now we've really shifted to looking at what community, what components can people access within a 10, minute walkability. And then within that 10 minute walkability, what are some of the barriers that may um, 
may hinder access to those parks. So that data has really helped us hone in and um, be intentional about um, the areas that we're able to install amenities or design new parks or look at land acquisition um, so that we can look at the district holistically um, and make sure that we are um, serving all of the needs of the community. And then we look at the next section of, of the toolkit where we look at that planning um, aspect of it. And so this here uh, showing is the more kind of regional planning where we are working really closely with our um, local jurisdictions to better understand what their community plans are um, and how the THPRD standards for parks and trails can be implemented into those overall plans. What you're seeing right here is a new urban area on the northern part of our district where um, the trails, the opportunities for trails may have been um, closer to the street than we typically like or, or um, not as off street, I suppose, as we'd like. And so one of the uh, benefits of collaborating with our, our local county jurisdiction was to be able to create a, cro create a cross section for a trail that may be close to the street and the roadway that um, is designed as a much wider system. And so um, instead of being a standard five to six foot sidewalk, we, did, we were able to collaborate, create, create this cross section that is a 12 to 14 foot wide clear um, walkway section with a buffer um, of tree plantings along the side. As those trees mature and get a little bigger, it'll be a, a more leisurely and welcoming place to, um, to access walkability and safety to different parks and trails within this area. Um, and at, at the regional level is a larger level. This particular picture is honing in on an actual site specific level where, um, or site specific plan where we're looking at implementing a new trail that will connect our regional trail system that um, houses quite a bit of um, amenities, including a tennis park that you see maybe on the northern side of that aerial, along with quite a few uh, play equipment opportunities uh, along that system. And it's connecting to um, Sexton Mountain Elementary School, which um, is a partnership, Safe Routes to School, that we work closely with. This particular amenity, uh, once installed, you can see on the bottom the aerial of how that will connect. Currently, right now, it's um, it's a, a denser space of vegetation, and we'll be able to create a nice walkable, um, safe opportunity for folks um, on the west side of, of the power line regional trail system to be able to access that that school safely. Uh, also, for folks on the east side of the trail system, they will now be able to access the trail and park systems that um, provide recreation and amenities. Not only does it provide safe routes to parks and, um, and recreation, it also provides opportunities connect to e-commerce, or not e-commerce, um, commercial buildings. It's a 10 mile stretch, um, uh, grocery, as well as public transportation. And then we look at the next phase or, or the next section of safe routes to parks toolkits, which is that implementation aspect. And it's really looking at how we can um, get construction on the ground, get programs on the ground um, so that people can really access those. One of uh, the great ways that we've seen uh, barrier, barriers being, being broken down, at least pedestrian barriers on, on larger major arterial and collector roadways is the installation of um, beacons, the rapid flashing beacons or actual light systems that provide a safe crossing for patrons, either walking or rolling um, to get to different amenities within the park district. We also look at our capital funding program, which ensures that we have frontage um, and or sidewalks that are um, along our park system or pathways along our park systems within our parks that are maintained to a level of service that is um, safe and accessible. 
We're installing signage along right of ways um, that allows people to visually understand exactly where they need to go to either um, if they're on an on street connection, maybe to hook up to a different segment of the trail or to get to a different park. We also look at um, our partner agencies and programming. We've worked with Safe Routes to School here recently to install a traffic playground at our Greenway Park where we have um, drawn a, a roadway as well as a pedestrian crossing, some stop signs, and it really allows patrons to and, and bicyclists to practice bike safety and pedestrian walking, um, which has been really fun and helpful for the for kids and parents and families alike. One of the things to note too is that construction, um, new construction is not the only uh, welcoming aspect or safe as aspect for our patrons. It's also what's happening inside the park, making sure that our parks are welcoming, that they um, are engaging and that, um, and that they are accessible. We've done that with including art in our parks and messaging systems that um, provide interpretive signage and gleaning gardens. One of our parks has um, a, 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 newly, a newly done gleaning garden, newly constructed gleaning garden where folks can actually come and pick the raspberries that were um, planted or the blueberries as they come in full bloom. We planted fruit trees, which provides an opportunity for education as well. And then we look at sustaining these um, elements that we are implementing with, within the park district system, whether that's programming, engagement, um, if it's building new parks and trails, we're looking at it from a maintenance perspective on the front end to ensure that um, our maintenance, once that amenity is constructed, that we're able to maintain it and we're, we're able to keep it at a level of service uh, just as it was installed. We are creating events and programming. Uh, we've done one, the pandemic uh, has had a shift a little bit and we've done events, smaller events at neighboring communities called Chalk the Block, Rock the Park, um, all in an effort to get folks out and moving. We've also looked at um, on the bottom right-hand side, our message gardens where um, we are painting rock, gar rock gardens where families, friends, and community members can share their thoughts in support of racial justice and other socially relevant themes. Um, one of the other big items is also um, ensuring that we have data on the back end once we install amenities. So this upper right hand um, section really highlights and shows how uh, when a trail crossing was constructed, uh, in 20, the end of 2013, it really highlights how the user uh, numbers have increased upwards to 3,000 users a month. And it really helps us um, provide leverage when we're looking for funding or partnership with other agencies. I could talk about so many more things that the Park District does. I feel like um, we're running out of time here. So I will pass it over to Becky and I'm happy to answer any questions if they pop up. Great, thank you so much. Um, let me share my screen quickly. Okay, um, <laughs> got screwed up on my slides, so please bear with me for a moment. <laughs> Um, thank you to our panelists so much for your presentation. I really appreciate um, your, your examples of what Walk With These programs and what implementing safe routes to parks in Oregon communities can look like. So as we ponder how to put these ideas into action, we're excited to also share a couple of opportunities for continued learning and technical assistance with you all. So first up, coming up in June, the Oregon Recreation and Parks Association will be holding a workshop to take a deeper dive into safe routes to parks. Amanda is going to share a little more detail about that. Um, Amanda, I'll invite you to come off mute and share a little bit more if you can. Thanks, Becky. Uh, so 
I, this is just, I'm sure all of you taking a look at this, the Safe Routes to Parks toolkit is an incredibly expansive, awesome toolkit with lots and lots of stuff to kind of dive into. So we are giving it a little time between now and then. Um, and I think Becky said June, but it's actually July 20th is when we have it. So we have a little more time, but what we are putting together is a tactical session. So part of the Oregon Recreation and Park Association's mission is to support recreation and park professionals in Oregon through leadership, education, advocacy, and member services. And this is just a way for us to take this awesome tool that has been developed and make sure that we can perpetuate it and keep it going and keep it working for all of you. And part of that is in addition to those partnerships you are all building within your communities, we wanna make sure that one of those partnerships is around the state as well with other professionals. So this tactical session, it's an hour long, will be an opportunity for you to see more real life examples like what Nicole shared today of how to use the toolkit. You will have an opportunity to ask questions of your peers, how they're using the toolkit, what parts of the toolkit they've really appreciated, maybe how they've divided the toolkit across different teams in order to utilize it. And you'll get in-depth knowledge about the technical aspects of the implementation. So we will really use this session, not as an overview, but as a deep, deep dive to hear how it is working for folks. And we'll also have additional resources at that tactical session as well. If we find that this tactical session has a lot of interest, but folks can't make it, or if every, those who can make it find that it's really helpful and they wanna do it again, we'll schedule another one in the future. Um, and I will post a link into the chat for how you can register. It is free and open to anyone. Wonderful, thank you so much, Amanda. Really looking forward to that session in July. Um, secondly, we want to share with you an ongoing opportunity for individual technical assistance. With support from the Oregon Health Authority, the Safe Routes Partnership will be avail available to provide one-on-one -on -one technical assistance to organizations in Oregon interested in exploring and implementing Safe Routes to Park. We have up to 50 hours of technical assistance available to anyone interested in implementing the toolkit. So if you have questions about the Safe Routes to Parks framework, you're interested in aligning your current work with Safe Routes to Parks, or you wanna take a deeper dive on the toolkit, um, please reach out and take advantage of these free office hours. Again, this opportunity is open to anyone interested in implementing Safe Routes to Parks, not necessarily just those who work in and with parks. So my email is on the screen and we will be posting a recording of the webinar as well as slides after today. I know we're coming up short on time, but we do want to have the opportunity to open up for any questions that um, attendees might have. And I'm going to see if I can open up the Q&A chat box to see if any have come in so far. And feel free to drop the question into the chat. Anything about the toolkit, ideas for aligning with Walk With Ease or implementing safe routes to park. I'll just give folks one minute there. Um, and then again, we will be posting a recording of this webinar as well as our presentation slides with our contact information. So if you think of something, um, please do reach out. Uh, it looks like a question from uh, Nicole Perry asked, who's the best contact at a parks and recreation district in general? Um, I wonder if Amanda or if Nicole, if one of you might have a response to that question. I would actually, um, if I can, Nicole, just uh, Nicole Perry, who asked the question, just ask back, are you looking for who to contact as a community member for your local park and rec district, or are you looking to reach out to a number of park and rec districts in the state? Nicole says at a certain district. Okay, um, so if you're looking to reach out to a certain district, um, you can, I'll put my email in the chat, you can let me know, um, reach out to me, let me know who you're trying to get a hold of, um, or, or what districts you're trying to get a hold of, and what it is you're trying to achieve, and I could probably find a contact for you. Awesome. 
Awesome. I do see another question from Hirsch, if there's a partnership between the Oregon Parks and Recreation District and their Parks and Scenic Byways. Um, we don't have folks from the Oregon Parks and Recreation District with us today, but um, I'd be happy to look into that and follow up with you. I know we're coming up to the um, back end of the hour, so I do want to just really thank our panelists and for all of you being here today, really appreciate your time and interest in Safe Routes to Parks. Hopefully you've learned something interesting about Safe Routes to Parks, Walk With Ease, and opportunities for implementation and technical assistance here in Oregon. If you do have other questions come up for myself or other panelists, please don't hesitate to reach out and I can connect you with folks as well. Um, thanks again so much for attending and have a wonderful rest of your day.